hi there. Good morning. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about defense mechanisms. How we uh, cope with and don't cope with suffering. Um, all of us in our individual lives and in our communities and in our countries uh, suffer to some extent. There are traumas that happen to us these experiences which disrupt us. And in previous Facebook Lives and in my books, I've talked a little bit about some of the ways in which we protect ourselves from the disruptions in our lives, from the doubt, the chaos. Um, but I thought I'd be more systematic today because I'm only, uh, you know, I, I threw out these defense mechanisms and I thought I would actually list 15 of them. Um, I thought that would be useful, not only in your individual lives, uh, but also as we think about our communities and um, our, our, our wider society. Because communities also use defense mechanisms to protect themselves from uh, difficult things. Some people are saying good morning to me and keep telling me where you're from, put down comments, thoughts, etc. Um, now, one thing I should say in terms of defense mechanisms uh, is that nobody is free from them and in fact they're not bad things at all they're very very useful they're there for a reason um, there are some defenses that are better than others and uh, we're going to touch on that uh, the real problem with defense mechanisms is when you're suffering a lot uh, a defense comes in as a way of protecting yourself from the from the impact of that suffering that's fantastic but there is a point when the defense against the suffering begins to cause more suffering than that which is protecting you against. And it prevents you from mourning. It prevents you from looking at the issues and moving on. Uh, some defenses you know, try to shut you down completely. And some defenses try to provide a certain calm in the storm of your life so that you can begin to look at things. And then there are some defenses that we use that actually take our suffering and our pain and are able to transfigure them, transform them into something positive. So we'll start with some of the more basic defense mechanisms and see if you can identify any that you use. Because actually one of the reasons why it's good to know defenses is because sometimes naming your defense in and of itself can help you to uh, kind of weaken its negative impact. Just the very fact of naming it, of being able to see it. Now often it takes more than that, but you know, we can't do everything in one Facebook Live. So we'll start with denial. Denial is one that we all know, I've talked about many times before. It's where you say you're not something that you are. The typical one is of course in alcoholism, we see denial often used by someone who says, I'm not an alcoholic. Now the problem is, somebody says, okay, well, I'm not an alcoholic. And I say, I'm not an alcoholic, so is that denial? You know, someone says to me, you're you an alcoholic? And I say, no, and you're like, well, hey, there's evidence of denial. And I say, I'm definitely not an alcoholic. And then you're like, well, that's definitely what an alcoholic would say. But denial is slightly different. Denial is when you deny something that nobody's asking you to deny. That's when you start to get a hint that denial is operating. Someone says, oh, listen, we're having a party at my house. There's not much alcohol. I'm going to go down and get some. I'm not an alcoholic or anything. And then you go, I didn't, didn't ask if you were an alcoholic. Why are you telling me you're not an alcoholic when I never asked? Uh, or on, you know, on Facebook and social media, if someone's always telling you something that you're not asking, they're always telling you how great their life is. Lots of photographs of sunsets and nice coffees and a you know, fantastic relationship. Now, one or two of those is fine. Someone just wanting to share with their friends a good time or a nice holiday. But if it's constant, it feels like the person is saying the opposite of what they are. Like they're, they're not trying to lie to you. They may be trying to lie to themselves by saying always, no, 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 my relationship's fine, my relationship's great, my relationship's great, when nobody's actually asking. <laughs> it's sometimes evidence that a certain form of denial is going on. The person is very happy. If someone keeps saying to you, I'm really happy, I'm really happy, oh, I'm so happy, 
often they're not very happy. Or if someone keeps saying, oh, I've totally got over the desire to be a writer. I've totally got over the desire to, you know, to have a family. Oh, yeah, no, that's, I don't want to do that at all. And they tell you that seven times in an hour. It, it often says that they haven't got over that yet, but they're just not able to face it. So that, that's denial. Uh, regression. Regression is an interesting one. Regression is when things are bad and tough. We regress to an earlier developmental phase. We might become clingy like a child would. We might become very dependent. Or I think also with regression, it, you could say you, you return to some of your childhood activities. You get into you know, comic books, buying toys. Again, there's nothing wrong with comic books. I read the odd comic book myself and all of that. But when you avoid or run away from your suffering by going back to some kind of more childlike activity from your past, that's often a sign that there's some difficulty in your life that you're trying to protect yourself from. Then, of course, there's acting out. Acting out is, uh, you know, at its most simple, it's when someone can't say I'm annoyed at you, so they throw a book at you, or they throw a dish at you, or they, they smash something. Um, acting out is, in a sense, um, a way of, I mean, it's a weird defense because it is actually expressing emotion, but it's expressing like a, too much emotion and it's it's not the emotion's not able to be expressed it's kind of like this cathartic explosion but the cathartic explosion actually doesn't allow you to work things out it makes you feel good you go out and you smash things you break things but it it doesn't allow you to process what's going on put it into words work it through so acting out is a very you know powerful thing that like for children a temper tantrum is a type of acting out they're unable to process their emotions and so it explodes. And then everything's fine. That's the thing. That's the problem. Acting like, bam, everything explodes and then everything's fine. Everything's good. Oh, it'll be great. Hasn't been worked through. Um, disassociation is another one. Disassociation is, and only some people do this. It's in the sense of like, um, some people can't do it. It's not as a defense that where you basically have, you disassociate from yourself, you feel out of body. When things are going bad, you kind of lose track of time and space and even where you are within yourself. You just suddenly, like, everything feels like walking through treacle. You, you feel otherworldly. Uh, and that's often a way for the body to shut down something that is very traumatic and very difficult. Again, this is what happens often when something very, very bad happens. That's often uh, if, if someone's been abused when they've been very young. Dissociation um, is a defense that, that, that can be used and goes into adult life. Um, another form of that kind of is compartmentalization. And this is a much more common one where we are simply able to compartmentalize our existence in such a way that we can shut off certain parts of ourselves. Uh, we can weirdly be very, very honest and yet like steal things from, from our friends and weirdly kind of keep these two uh, there because they're compartmentalized. We don't really kind of like face those parts of ourselves. Um, we keep them in clean containers, uh, now, which again is able to help us function in life. But ultimately, um, the compartmentalization means that uh, uh, we're not able to integrate our lives and kind of like begin to kind of be more consistent. Um, uh, projection. Projection is where we um, take our inner pain, our inner struggles, and we're not able to face them, so we push them out and we put them onto somebody else. And we hate someone else, but actually the hatred is a hatred of a part of ourselves. We see this sometimes when people leave religion, for example, they can hate the community that they left. Hate it with a passion. You, um, you listen to what's being said. Sorry, by the way, every now and again when I, when I touch the screen, it's because I'm moving uh, <laughs> notifications away. Um, you, there's this, this, such a despising of, of what you've come from and the people who are still there. And sometimes you've got good reason to not like that. But in a sense... It often is a way of hating that part of yourself that you might not have actually worked through. So this hatred of the other is really a hatred of yourself that is projected out. 
Again, developmentally, this is when a child maybe says there's a monster under the bed. Their child is projecting their fear, anxiety, and dislikes outside themselves into something else or into a teddy bear or whatever, when really that is kind of within them. And then a final, pr more primitive uh, defense mechanism is reaction formation. Reaction formation is where you do the opposite of what you are. Um, so it's not denial where you say you don't have a problem, it's actually where you look like you're the very opposite. So for example, somebody might read apologetics all the time, they may be obsessed with kind of like, you know, Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict. Um, and we think, oh my goodness, that's because they're so into certainty. But sometimes that can actually be um, the, the clothing that uncertainty and insecurity wears. So the very, the very extreme is, is, is a sign of the opposite. Somebody goes out and they're always showing off about their great job, their great car, how much money they earn, and they seem so arrogant. Sometimes that arrogance can be the clothing that self-hatred and low self-esteem wears. And it's, you know, we, we all kind of know this, but we have to remind ourselves sometimes that, that when we present very strongly in one way, it can be a reaction formation against the other way. Okay, so there's uh, seven kind of more primitive defense mechanisms. So uh, if I was sitting with you in your room, I go, is there, is there any of those that you identify with in yourself? And you go, oh yeah, I kind of do that. Uh, or in your community. Okay. A community can have reaction formation. A community can act out. A community can engage in denial. Now I want to look at a few other defense mechanisms that are, um, uh, you know, that, that allow for a little crack of light in, in our suffering. Um, there is uh, intellectualization. Intellectualization is where you avoid confronting some pain and some suffering in your life or your community through uh, living here in your mind. So like a lot of people in the academy, they go into studying philosophy or uh, physics or something like that because that's their way of avoiding confronting the chaos that's within the, the emotional life. Um, you know, you see this in extreme ways and you, know, see, maybe you see these movies about uh, these great uh, intellectual figures. You, they often play on that. You know, you can take that, you know, they, they're terrible at relationships. They shut themselves off. They, they don't quite know how to feel and how to respond, how to react. Um, so we kind of, we see that in, um, I'm trying to think of what movies have come out recently that are like that. The Imitation Game. I think, you know, that kind of has the, the figure in that, uh, isn't that about, um, oh, I should have done my research. It's the guy, Turing, Alan Turing, I think, yeah, um, who kind of is acting in a tightly, slightly kind of Asperger's kind of way, an emotionally, you know, distant kind of way. So that's intellectualization. Um, there is also connected to that kind of rationalization. Rationalization is where you, it's not, intel it's not where you escape into the world of the intellect, Rationalization is where when terrible things happen, you find um, a way of interpreting it that protects you from looking, looking at the difficult things. So in a relationship, um, it breaks down and you go, well, that person was terrible. They were always awful. They were out to get me. Right? So you're rationalizing, you're, you're providing interpretation that gives meaning to the chaos, which is fine and good, but it also prevents you from actually working through the pain. In, in, in a structural way, in religion, rationalization is where it would, would be theodicy, where you give reasons for people's suffering. Oh, you know, that's, that, that cancer, or, you know, that's, that's to do with the fall, or that's to do with God is testing you, wanting to see if you'll remain faithful through this. Uh, that's a great way to avoid actually just sitting in the pain <laughs> and looking at it and being like Job and just going, what, what does this mean? So, you know, theodicy could be seen as a form of rationalization that protects ourselves from exp experiencing the chaos of existence. If you take the Holocaust or Shoah, um, uh, there's a sense of if you provide a theodicy on that, it actually is deeply offensive. You know, it's, oh, oh, it's a test, it's a purification process, it's this, it's that, it's like, ah, no, that, but sometimes, Sometimes having a reason for suffering 
feels better to us than even if it's a terrible reason even if i'm like oh i'm suffering because god hates me <laughs> that can sometimes strangely still be more calming than i don't have any reason for this suffering i have to experience the absurdity of it so rationalization is in some respects protecting you from the absurdity of one's suffering and like actually being in it um also uh, let's think uh undoing undoing is um where you say something really terrible to somebody and then you immediately feel bad and say a hundred amazing things about them oh no actually you're brilliant you're fantastic or you're really nice you're you're really nasty to your kids and then you buy them lots of presents um where you so act um, undoing is where you try to <clears throat> in a sense put the toothpaste back in the pack in the toothpaste thing the toothpaste thing the tube whatever it is <laughs> um it's like it's out there and your way of not like working through your acting out you're kind of like ah you know that that pissed off thing that you are is to immediately like be super nice and super kind which is you know fine and good for the person but then that that you know you, you see this abusive behavior then where someone acts out they're emotionally abusive to you or something like that and then they're oh they're so nice and they do all this stuff and then you go oh it's okay and then they bam it happens again and undoing and this again is it becomes a repetitive uh, uh what's called a compulsive repetition the the rep this repeats and repeats and repeats until it, you actually look at what's going on beneath it <clears throat> um okay so there's a few more and again you can ask yourself do i do i see myself in intellectualization do i rationalize do i try to undo um uh do i uh um oh repression another one we do repress just push down the negative feelings and pretend they're not there it's a way of kind of like censoring yourself but now i want to go on a kind of a third little cluster and these are actually kind of like defense mechanisms that protect you against the sheer horror of unmitigated suffering but they do something really powerful with that suffering right because in a sense to be human is to is to always have a type of armor semi-permeable armor that protects you from raw experience of horror and sometimes that armor becomes so impermeable and that's those early defenses that's acting out reaction formation denial sometimes it's semi-permeable that's the ones we were looking at there you know intellectualization rationalization these kind of allow a little bit in but sometimes the armor can um can really help us deal with and explore our suffering and i want to mention three first is assertiveness assertiveness can be described as where you feel something painful some attack on you and instead of acting out or engaging in the other defenses or turning that, that inward against yourself you're able to express yourself express your dissatisfaction express your anger but in a way that is both clear concise controlled now you'll have experienced that in your own life whenever you're able to say to the person what you want to say but you don't say too much you don't blow it up out of proportion and you don't hide away you're able to express yourself that can provide a certain way of working through that pain and robbing it of its of its sting i actually just saw a black mirror episode uh last night which looked at this it was an episode about social media and how we're all wanting to be like to set kind of sometime in the near future where you rate everybody one to five stars every interaction you have and so everybody's super nice to each other taking pictures of everything that looks you know the beautiful sunsets always trying to get the five star like and as the episode goes on someone's life begins to fall apart and they gradually have to learn how to express themselves so it's really a really good episode about um the defense of assertiveness um so i i forget what it's called but it's the first episode of season three yeah. um the the other one i want to look at is uh compensation compensation is where if you have a weakness we all have weaknesses you come to know your weaknesses 
maybe you know you find social interaction very difficult you find it very exhausting uh, you find small talk very very difficult right all of that you know so you find power and social situations you know painful compensation is where you find a way of kind of i suppose in a sense turning that do finding a strength finding something that uh it comes like for i suppose in that example it would be you know enjoying deep conversations getting really going in a deep way into into a, a person's life you compensate by going yeah i am weak in that area and i accept that and actually i acknowledge it and i tell people listen the reason why i can't go to your party it's not because i'm sick or it's not because i've got anything else to do i just really don't like parties i'm really rubbish at them but i would love to uh you know you know for a couple of us to get together come around to my house and we'll, we'll chat about stuff so what you do is you kind of acknowledge your weaknesses and you compensate you find a way what's the strength in that what's the what's the what's what can you kind of like concentrate on um and then the final one which is i think my favorite one um is sublimation sublimation is where you take your suffering and your pain and you're able to turn it into something beautiful and good. Well, a, a better way to say it would be if you make it into fuel. You take, basically you take the shit and you make it into a type of fuel that generates transformation. Um, so for example, uh, if you know, you've gone through some sort of uh, really painful abuse in your past, you might be able to over time find a way to use that to help other people who have gone through similar experiences now that's difficult because in one sense you have to have a lot of healing in order to be able to do that you know, well it's very difficult or you might be able to take your your life experiences and put it into music into art uh, into writing that's a form of sublimation because this this pain of a, say, a breakup, a, de a devastating divorce, is just cut through you like, like a searing knife. Uh, then you, you write it into a song. And in a sense, oh, do you feel great as a result of it? No, no, you might feel better. You might feel amazing. You know, you've still got the suffering and the pain. It's, it's, it doesn't magically go away, but, but you've given something beautiful to me and to other people. And you have, in a sense, maybe helped me touch some of those parts of my life through listening to your song. It helps me to heal. Uh, in art, you paint. And whether you give those paintings to your friends or your family or whether you, you know, put them in an art gallery, those paintings can speak to me and be a gift. And in that, I do think you again rob the weight of that yoke you kind of you, you lighten that burden on your shoulders yes you've still got a yoke on your shoulders but it's lightened and you can get this pleasure from seeing how you've been able to put that into something useful and beautiful and good so that's that's you know 15 defense mechanisms <laughs> um, it's really great to be able to think about you know which ones you use in your life how they've benefited you and how they have maybe held you back. Begin to name them and also even name them whenever you do them with other people, with your partner or your friends. Go, listen, you know what I'm doing here? I am totally in denial. <laughs> um, I'm just going to name it um, or I'm totally rationalizing here. But also in our communities, uh, when we suffer from pain and doubt and unknowing in our communities, do, do we tend to... Uh, you know, split the world into good and bad. I don't know if I talked about splitting, actually, did I? You know, splitting the world into good and bad. Do we regress or do we sublimate? Um, are we assertive? Do we, you know, the difference between assertiveness and acting out is slightly different. Acting out is you go and you smash cars, you know, you burn buildings. Sometimes you, you, you know, sometimes you have to do that. <laughs> um, but, but ultimately, you know, that's not going to, over time, transform things acting out can be turned into assertiveness so you don't condemn acting out no you go like acting out something we do 
but we go right how do we then take this acting out and turn it into assertiveness which is you know forceful and does speak but in a way that can that can that can make things happen how do we do that in our own lives and in our communities you know how do we uh, intellectualization is important how do we think through things but how do we make sure we're not doing that in such a way that we're protecting ourselves okay i'll just have a little look and see if anybody's got any questions or comments um let's see ba -ba -ba. oh and sometimes i don't answer questions because i just don't see the comments until after i've logged out that happens loads i log out and then i go oh i should have there's a great great question i don't know whether that's because you're actually asking it slightly after i've logged out or if i'm just missing it but if you ask a good question and you wonder why i haven't even acknowledged it um, it might be because i don't like you um, because you're not very likable people but it also might be because i didn't see it um there's Adam. Pete, do you have personal experience discovering any of those these defense mechanisms in your own life? Yeah, good. Let me think of an example of when I have engaged in one of these. Um, I mean, it's not I'm thinking because there's so few. I mean, there's, this is this is stuff we do all the time. I mean, maybe a simple one might be kind of uh, um, intellectualization. I mean, I went into philosophy. I, I. I went into the academic, not quite later on in my life actually, I didn't do any of that till I was in my 20s. But I think maybe that's one way I, I kind of notice that I try to cope with or avoid coping with certain struggles. So, you know, if, if things are difficult, I'll go to a coffee shop and read some book and, and think and live here in my head. And, you know, part of acknowledging that is not because I, I noticed it directly, but indirectly, you look around and there's books everywhere <laughs> in my house. These books actually aren't mine, just in case you're always, you're looking at what books are behind me. This is my housemate. He's very into Rudolf Steiner. So I've got lots of, so in the future, if anybody's looking at this and going, right, what's Pete into? And then they look at the bookshelf that's behind my Facebook page. I'm not, you know, big into Rudolf Steiner. So <laughs> I don't, don't know if he can see them or not. Uh, my housemate, he's a very smart guy as well, but he's, uh, he's more into, uh, anthroposophy than, than I would be. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, I've got a good, oh, I, um, I cannot pronounce your name, sorry, because I'm from Ireland, and um, Esenji, Esenji, is that correct? I don't know. Please forgive me if that's not. But uh, it says, we're, I'm sure we're all addicts. Every last one of us <laughs> um, has something we can't cope with and have something that can numb us while we're not coping. Absolutely. That's, that's it. Like, I don't want anybody to listen to this and go, I'm saying that these defenses are bad or there's a way beyond them. In fact, in one sense, I want to say there's no beyond. There is no unmitigated experience of reality outside ways to uh, mold it, protect it, interpret it. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, I don't think there's any exception. Um, we fantasize there are exceptions. This is what's called the non-castrated other. The non-castrated other is this fantasy other who has got everything. They're, they're happy, they're content, they're whole and they're complete. And um, it's like whenever you break up with someone and you fantasize that they're having a great time, they're enjoying themselves, they're partying while you're, you know, collecting urine and balls and have a tinfoil hat on, right, crying in the corner. It's this fantasy of the other who doesn't need the fences, who's just having a ball. But in a sense, um, struggle, there, there is, as Freud says, there's the traumas that happen to us, but there is the trauma that is us. Uh, there, there's two, so there's the trauma that is being human a universal trauma, and then there are traumas that take place that happen to us, um, and depending on how you're brought up and your experience of life, there can be more or less. Interestingly, uh, the difference between parotheology that I do and psychoanalysis, one of the differences is that psychoanalysis primarily focuses on the traumas that happen to us. That's what gets you into the room. And then they indirectly help you look at the trauma that is us, that is to be being human. Whereas in parotheology, I concentrate on the universal trauma that is being human, and that only indirectly touches on the traumas 
that each of us face in our lives. But yeah, no, I love that. We're all addicts. Every last one of us has something we can't cope with and have something that can numb us while we're not coping. And if you go back and you listen to this Facebook, the first seven defense mechanisms I mentioned are more, um, are more primal. So they're, they're less useful in helping us work through our traumas. And the ones that I kind of recovering at the end were ones that are, that are more helpful. So um, if we can get to assertiveness, sublimation and compensation, we're, we're, we're doing good. Uh, but we'll never do that completely. All right, let's see. <laughs> Joshua, uh, with upcoming holidays and encountering the estranged family relationships, how do we be like Job? <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, that's right. Thanksgiving is happening um, soon. I love Thanksgiving, by the way. I think it's a great holiday. I mean, I know what, what I'm talking about, kind of how I've experienced it rather than what it means, actually. <laughs> uh, but um, in that, um, I, I've been invited by very kind families. Every year I get invitations to, to be with people I, I don't even really know to enjoy a great meal. Um, there's no um, financial side of it, buying presents and all of that. It's, it's very good. But I know for a lot of people, it's very traumatic because you go back with your family and then you have to try to avoid talking about politics and religion and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, I guess the holidays are a season when our defense mechanisms are up. So just keep an eye on it. That's a good thing. Yeah, see on Thanksgiving, you'll find out what your defense mechanisms are. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh yeah, Adam says, Brené Brown talks about vulnerability. Do you see vulnerability playing a role in discovering our defense mechanisms? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, part of vulnerability is, is admitting to yourself your defenses. I mean, you know, the more we close ourselves down, pretend everything's fine, the less we're going to discover those defenses, the more we engage in in these repressions, these defenses, and then the more we have symptoms. I mean, the problem with, with defense mechanisms, sometimes it's not that they're a problem, it's that they create more suffering and they fix over time. So they create symptoms, and the symptoms become a real place of destruction in our lives and in the lives of other people. So yeah, to, to be vulnerable, I guess, in some respects, is to take a breath, step back, and, and, and be honest. Um, about yourself and to do that you have to have a certain amount of grace for yourself and for other people so a certain amount of like it's okay you know don't I'm not going to judge myself I'm not going to judge other people here I'm going to just I'm just going to let these defenses speak I'm just going to going to become aware of them I'm going to ask why they're there and what they're covering over you know I could do this all day but I can't because you've got other things to do you probably have like more important things than this. Um, uh, okay, I'll do one more uh, and then and then I'll let you go. Um, I'll let you go. I mean, you can actually log out. Um, I do take a note of who logs out. It tells me. And uh, if I'm ever in power, I will come and find you. But uh, anyway, uh, Jared says, um, would it be possible that our perception of something being trauma is in many cases what makes it trauma? If I hear you correctly, I think you're, 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 you're absolutely right in that. Traumas are interesting things, right? A trauma is not what happens. It's, well, it's in a sense how it subjectively impacts us. You know, the weird thing is like a, something can be traumatic, which is tiny. A child hearing a loud television set downstairs and thinking that that's their parents arguing can cause, can, can, be a, can be traumatic to the child. And then something else that is actually incredible, like somebody growing up during a conflict, a bloody conflict, and seeing an explosion, and seeing someone die, it can, while being very, very difficult, not become a type of trauma that, that lives with us. So it's, it's interesting how it, it requires something objective, something out in the world happens, but it has to have a subjective anchor in us. It has to couple with something subjectively in us for it to become a trauma rather than, you know, either an inconsequential thing or a bad thing or whatever it is. The, if it's purely an objective um, and it hasn't coupled with something within you, then it's not 
it's not a trauma. So if Jared, if what you're saying is in some sense, your subject, your subjectivity has to be invested in some way in, in what happens objectively, then, then yes, it's not, you cannot say that an act is going to be traumatic for everybody. Um, it's, uh, you know, and I grew up in, I say in a conflict and, you know, in a violent time and, um, some of us, while it was difficult and painful, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was a source of, of trauma and for others it was. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Thank you for, uh, for sparing with me, um, on my, uh, Facebook live things. Um, I'm going to be taking a break, not from these, I'm going to keep doing it, but I'm going back to Ireland soon. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Jay Baker's going to come with me, going to do an event back in my hometown of Belfast. Um, and then I'm going to be in 2017, get hitting the road. I'm going to be doing some more events in LA, going to be traveling around. So I hope you can join me for some of those, for some of those events and, uh, whatever. So have a great day and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.